Welcome to Full Gospel Fellowship. If you like what you see here, hit that thumbs up and remember to subscribe to our channel. Thank you and God bless. We're going to be in Acts chapter 7, verses 51 through 60. Acts chapter 7, verses 51 through 60, as we, uh, are, as we minister part 3 of this message uh, on Stephen. As we get to this portion of his message that he ministered to these people, that were falsely accusing him. And as we read what Stephen said, some might say that's harsh. But how many knows that God told him what to say? How many knows that he was moved by the Holy Spirit to say everything that he had to say? And how many knows that sometimes the truth hurts, but we need to hear the truth? Amen? Because the truth will set you free. Yeah. Acts 7, 51 through 60 says, Stephen speaking, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one of whom you have, na of, of whom you have been now the betrayers and the murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears, and they ran upon him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down, and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now we're continuing this series on God raising up spiritual warriors for him. And what does that mean? You know, when you think of a warrior in today's world and you think of sports, you think of a fighter, you think of a boxer, you think of a, one of those mixed martial artists as a, as a fleshly warrior uh, in the sports arena, but in the same manner, uh, God's raising up spiritual warriors for Him. What is that? That's people that may get knocked down, but they don't stay down. They get right back up. Amen? Those are people that know who they are, that know who their God is, that know where they came from, and that no matter what this world tries to, tries to come against them with, they're going to stand on the Word. They're going to stand on the truth according to the Word. Amen? Amen? Spiritual warriors are those that will not compromise this Word. But how many, and, I, and I've said this a million times, and if I've said it that many times, I'll keep saying it until I, I have no breath left in my body. But God has not raised up one minister in this world to conform this message to the liking of the people. Amen? God has called ministry up in the world today to preach, thus saith the Lord, and to preach exactly what God Tell, tells them to preach. Amen. Ministry that conforms the message to the people's liking have not been called by God, but and if they ever have been called by God, they've turned their back on the calling that God called them to. Does that make sense? Amen. I've heard people say, well, you know, we need to preach this way and that way. And I've said, then you're preaching what you want to preach out of your own mind. Amen. God's not called you to preach this way and that way. God's called you to preach His Word without compromise. And He's called you to preach it the way He's called you to preach it. we gotta, we got to fix things up in the church uh, to make the kids happy. No, you don't. You just got to get the kids in church and let God do the rest. Amen. There's nothing that says the kids got to be happy. There's nothing that says anybody's got to be happy in the flesh. We're here to do one thing, and that's make God happy. That's to please Him. And if we'll do that, everything else will fall into line. 
So we're, we're continuing this series on God raising up spiritual warriors for Him. And He's not raising up compromisers. Spiritual warriors is what God has always raised up. Uh, God raises up people who, who, who will stand on His Word, who will proclaim the truth no matter what. God does not raise up people. God didn't save anybody to compromise the truth for any reason. And a couple weeks ago, again in review, we talked about the three Hebrew children's uncompromising stand for Jesus when faced with either uh, choosing to worship the golden image that the king had set up or choosing to be thrown into a burning, fiery furnace to die. Because the three Hebrew children would not compromise. Because they would not worship anything other than their God, which is the God of the Bible because they would not compromise their relationship with God in any way. They chose to be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Their attitude was, we know that God can deliver us if He wants to, but even if He doesn't, we will never, ever worship that golden image which represents sin, which represents idolatry, which represents religion, which represents the world which represents what society calls moral and right, even though it stands in direct opposition to the Word of God. These great men of God refuses, refuse to worship this image, which represents anything that's not of God, even if it meant losing their lives. Because of their obedience to God, because of their refusal to compromise their walk with Him in any way, because of their refusal to worship what the king wanted them to worship, because of their refusal to accept what the world wanted them to accept, because they would not compromise their integrity in order to save their lives. God delivered them from that burning, fiery furnace without even a hint of them ever being in the fire. And then God blessed them, and God gave them favor. He caused that king to promote them, and that king gave them high positions in his kingdom because they would not bow the knee to what the king told him to bow the knee to. And because he saw God do a miracle when he threw him in a fire, and he saw that fourth man, Jesus, walking in the fire with him. Amen? Last week, we began to talk about Stephen, another spiritual warrior for Jesus, another great man of God who would not compromise, but who had the resolve and the courage to speak the truth and to stand on the Word of God regardless of the cost to Him, which are the kind of people that God has always raised up, and which are the kind of people that God is raising up in these last days that we're living in. And I mentioned this on Wednesday night, and I'm going to repeat it again. But according to this minister on TV named Perry Stone, there's a hundred congressmen in the United States government who are in favor of passing a law which would prohibit churches and preachers from ever saying that homosexuality and same-sex marriage is a sin. They want to pass a law in this country that prohibits true men and women of God from preaching the truth according to the Bible, which not only directly opposes the Word of God and further promotes this ever-increasing godless, godless anti-Christian society that we're living in today, but it stands in direct opposition to the Constitution which allows for religious freedom, regardless of what your religion is. And if they get enough support to pass this bill, they're going to fine and incarcerate people who will not bow the knee to their golden image, which is sin, but who will instead obey God and continue to speak the truth no matter the cost, just like the three Hebrew children did, just like Stephen did, and just like any spiritual warrior for Jesus will do when faced with this, do what we tell you to do or else mentality that this present day society has. And let me just say this, if the truth per the word of God offends you, if it bothers you to say that homosexuality and abortion is a sin, if it makes you angry to say that the transgender lifestyle is wrong, as well as any other lifestyle that God's Word calls wrong, 
If the standards of God which are written in His Word offends you, if what the Bible calls right and wrong offends you, if calling sin what it is gets under your skin, then you need to know that your heart is not right with God. And you need to find you a place to pray. And you need to find you an altar somewhere and get before God. Because you need to repent. And you need to get your life right with God. Because if you're a true Christian, then you should be offended in that which dares to stand in opposition to God's Word. Because anything that contradicts the Bible is of the devil. And all the devil cares about is destroying lives through all forms of sin. I get tired of Christians bowing the knee to the golden image and saying, don't say anything about this. Don't say anything about that. Those poor people this and those poor people that. We love the people, but the sin will destroy them. And then the sin will permeate society and destroy everybody else with it. Why do you think God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? So those sins could not uh, spread across the globe like it was doing. It was only going to get worse. And God judged those people because He would not change, though He gave them every opportunity to do so. Stop being offended because the preacher preaches the truth and the truth lines up the word. But be offended in the sin that comes against the truth because that thing's of the devil. Right. Sin in all forms is a bondage. Sin is what nailed Jesus to the cross. Sin is what put Jesus in the tomb. Sin destroys people's lives. Sin is the enemy of God, and as such, it should be our enemy as well. And if it's not, we got to get on our knees and we got to ask God to forgive us and give us a heart for Him and understand that He's our friend. This world is not. He's our God. Sin is not our friend. Sin will seek to destroy you. Sin is the enemy of God, and as such it should be our enemy as well. So no, we cannot compromise with sin and with this world in order to make people happy. We cannot compromise with what the Word of God says as, so as not to offend people. We cannot ever compromise in order to spare hurt feelings because you see, God is raising up spiritual warriors for Him. And if we're going to be a spiritual warrior for Jesus, we got to tell people the uncompromising truth according to the Bible because the truth is the only thing that will ever set people free from sin and bondage in their life. You see, love tells people the truth because love wants people to get right with God. Love tells people the truth because love wants to see people get saved, healed, and delivered. Love tells people the truth because love wants to see people become all they can be in God. Love wants everybody to have all that God has for them. In reviewing the story of Stephen to this point, chapter 6 tells us that as the number of the disciples was growing, as more and, pe more, and more people were, were, were getting saved and added to the church, there was a complaint brought forth from some of the people that the widows, their widows were being overlooked in the daily passing out of some form of relief, which was in the form of food and probably money. The church took care of their widows who, who evidently had no way to support themselves and who had no family members to support them, which is what the Bible tells us to do. And the apostles, the, who were the overseers of the church, told the disciples it wouldn't make any sense for them to, to leave the Word of God and to serve tables. It wouldn't be advantageous for them to take time and attention away from what they were supposed to do, which was preaching the gospel in order to take care of this issue. In other words, there were plenty of people in the church who would make sure that this was done and who would probably be glad to do it. Because you see, people who love God want to serve Him. And people who love God will be willing to do whatever God wants them to do. The apostles told the disciples to find seven men who have a good reputation, who are full of the Holy Spirit and godly wisdom, so they can delegate this job to them. And this way the apostles would be able to give themselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. They'll be able to give all of their time and attention to do what God's called them to do. And then the church would flourish. Because, why would it flourish? Because all of the members would be working together, performing the function for the church that God had called each one to perform, which would then enable the church to be all that it could be in God. In the same manner that 
All of our body parts work together, which causes the body to work as it should in order for it to be a healthy body. And the disciples were pleased with what the apostles said to do. They chose Stephen, who was a man full of faith in God, and who was full of the Holy Ghost, along with six other men who all met the criteria that the apostles were looking for in men who were going to perform this job. Having said that, let me say this, and I've learned this over the years, but if you're going to do something in the church, if you're going to be given a responsibility in the church, if you're going to be a leader in the church, if you're going to be a true member of God's church, there are standards that must be met. Just like the apostles had standards for the men who were going to look after the widows in the church at that time. Preachers, teachers, singers, musicians, youth teachers, board members, those that are put in charge of the money, and so on, whatever it is, must be people who are saved. They must be believe in the deity of Christ which is a belief that directly affects salvation. They must believe that the Bible is the infallible and inerrant Word of God. What does inerrant mean? It means it's capable of being wrong. They must be people who are doing their best to live by and to obey God's Word. They must be people who love God with all of their heart and who love others. they got to be people who are faithful in coming to the house of God. they got to be people who are paying their tithes. Because tithes is what God requires each and every one of us to do. And that is a direct reflection on our faith in God. It's a reflection on our commitment to Jesus and on our willingness to obey God in all areas of our life. I paid my tithes for years. And when I heard a preacher tell me one time he don't pay his, this may sound harsh to some and I didn't say it to him, but I thought, what kind of preacher are you? that you don't even give God the first fruits of all that you have, which is the, the, the least that God demands of us. I'll just say it from a minister's point of view. A minister who won't pay his tithes shouldn't be preaching the gospel until he gets that straight with God. A minister who won't obey or do his best to obey everything this Word says to do. Yes, we fail, but we repent and we get back up. But a minister who won't do their best to, 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 to do what the Word of God says to do is not fit to preach to the people. Amen? we got to be sold out people for Jesus. Spiritual warriors for Him, as, what, as we've been talking about. These seven men... Um, whom the disciples picked to oversee this task, they were brought before the apostles. They laid their hands on them, they prayed for them, and the Word of God increased. More and more people were getting saved, and the church was growing. And Stephen, a man full of faith in the power of God in his life, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Stephen produced the attributes and the characteristics of God in his life, which somebody who is truly of God will do. The power of God was evident in his life through the miracles and the great wonders that he did among the people. Then there arose some people. Then there arose some people who set out to cause dissension and division in the church. There arose some people whose goal was not to support and to pray for the church, but whose goal was to cause trouble in the church, which is the goal of the devil whose number one tactic of trying to cause dissension and division is through religious spirits in the church who are always saying and doing something to stir the pot, which is precisely what these people were doing. They disputed with Stephen. They didn't like what he was preaching to the people because what he was preaching was the truth. And the truth will never agree with religiosity any more than it will agree with the world. The truth will, will, will never agree with sin. Of course it won't. But neither will it agree with religion. Neither will it agree with denominational church, church rules and regulations. Neither will it agree with man-made standards, with our opinions and viewpoints, with dress codes, with what we think, and so on. The truth will never agree with anything that's not based on the Word of God. And people who want to hang on to their religiosity, they hate the truth when it comes down to it. 
Though they will claim to be followers of God, they will hate the truth when religion means more to them than anything else. I don't care what your church says. I don't care what your pastor says. I don't care what your favorite politician says. I don't care what the president says. All that matters is the Word of God. All that matters is what thus saith the Lord says. And anything that stands in opposition to God's Word is wrong. Anything that contradicts God's Word is of the devil. And we better never support that which disagrees agrees with or opposes God's word in any way. Otherwise, we're supporting evil. These people disputed with Stephen, but they were not able to resist the, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. They were not able to truthfully argue with anything that he said because he spoke the truth. And how many knows that the truth is a debate ender? So what did they do? They got some people together who lied on Stephen and who twisted what he said in order to turn people against him. Which shows us that people who are full of religious spirits will do whatever they got to do to get things done their way. They'll stir up the people. And they'll try to get things changed to their liking. They have no desire for God to have His way. They have no desire to really hear the truth. They only care about what they want. They want it all their way. So they got these people together who claimed that they heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They stirred the people up, which tells us how easy people can get stirred up when they listen to gossip. This religious crowd turned the same people who fellowship with Stephen and who saw him perform great wonders and miracles among the people. These same people that fellowship with Stephen turned against him in a heartbeat, all because they listened to some noise coming from somebody with a religious spirit. They caught Stephen. They brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses which claimed that Stephen ceases not to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and against the law. In other words, he don't preach like we like it. <coughs> they claimed that they heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses had delivered to them, which was related to the fact that Stephen must have preached that Jesus fulfilled every single demand of the old law on the cross, which then totally replaced it with a new covenant, which is what we're all under today. And how many knows that's the truth? As these false accusations and lies were coming Stephen's way, as people continually twisted his words, Stephen just sat there. He listened to him. He didn't argue or respond in anger. He just waited for his turn. And then the Bible says that all that sat in the council looked intently at Stephen. They saw his face as it had been the face of an angel which speaks to the glory of God being all over him. And then in Acts chapter 7, the high priest was now going to give Stephen a chance to give a rebuttal on all of these things that were just said about him. So he said... To Stephen, are these things so? Is what these people saying about you true? So Stephen gives a history lesson on God's dealings with Israel. And I'm just going to highlight some of the things that he said because the message that Stephen was about to deliver was, was a lengthy one. Stephen didn't hold back. What he was about to say was the truth delivered without compromise according to God's word. And this is just a great example on how the truth must be spoken and stood on regardless of the cost to us because that's what God raises up spiritual warriors to do. You see, no matter what situation or circumstance that we find ourselves in, our number one goal is to glorify Jesus Christ through our circumstances and situations. Stephen begins to tell these people about Abraham and about how God told him to, to get out of the country that he was in and to get away from the people that he was around and to come into the land that God would show him, which was the land of Canaan, the promised land that God promised to his people who were the children of Israel, who was the church in the Old Testament. Then Stephen tells him about how God tells Abraham that the, that the children of Israel would be in bondage to the Egyptians for 400 years. But God would judge that nation. And then after God's people were freed from their bondage, they would serve God in the promised land. He tells them about Joseph and how his brothers who were, filled, who were filled with jealousy sold him into slavery. But God was with Joseph. 
He delivered him out of all of his afflictions. God gave him favor in the eyes of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who made Joseph the governor of Egypt because he didn't sell out his integrity. God used Joseph, Joseph to save many lives in the famine that came over Egypt, including his brothers and his father's life, which then reunited that family. Stephen tells the council about Moses and how God kept him alive after he was born, uh, though the king of Egypt at the time had ordered all of the baby boys to be killed. After Moses grew up, God got his attention by speaking to him through a burning bush. And Stephen told him how God appointed Moses as the one who would lead the children of Israel out from Egyptian bondage. And Stephen tells him how Moses told the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you uh, of your brethren like unto me, and him shall you hear. This was Stephen reminding these people that Moses in this statement that he made to the children of Israel in his day, he foretold of the coming of Christ whom these people who were accusing Stephen had rejected and had refused to believe in. This same Jesus who these people despised and hated. This same Jesus whom Stephen believed in and preached about. This same Jesus whom Stephen said brought a new and a better covenant than the old one. This same Jesus whom these religious church people hung on a cross to die was foretold of by the same prophet that they all claimed to follow, which was Moses. And had they really believed Moses, then they would have believed Jesus. And Moses told the people that the same God who raised him up will also raise up another prophet who is of your brethren, just like he was in him shall you hear, which is Jesus Christ. And Stephen goes on to tell them about how their fathers rebelled against God, how they worshipped other idols, how they turned against Moses, and instead of worshipping God, they worshipped the work of their own hands. Instead of leaning solely on God himself, they began to lean on their own understanding. They leaned on what they could do and on what they thought and on their own ideas of worship instead of worshiping God's way and following His plan. Stephen talks to him about David who found favor before God. He talks to him about Solomon who built a, God a house. But then Stephen reminds them that, uh, that God says that He does not dwell in houses built with hands because heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool, so what house could possibly be built for God? Stephen just preached to these people a message which spoke of the, which spoke of the Israelites' constant rebellion against God and how easily that they would turn their back on him and give themselves over to idol worship despite all that God had done for them. And then he ends his message by saying, you stiff-necked and stubborn people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Ghost. You always reject God and His Word. God blesses you, and you continue to fall back in your old ways. You're faithful when you're desperate, but as soon as God touches your heart, you don't ever come to church anymore. You wait till something bad happens before you get right with God, when you should have got right and stayed right with Him in the first place. But let me also say this. If that's what it took, thank God for it. Repent of your sins and just make sure you stay right with God from this day forward. You stiff-necked and stubborn people, just as your fathers did, just as the church in the wilderness did, just as they did, you do the exact same thing. Which of the true prophets of God have not your fathers persecuted? They've killed those which have proclaimed and foretold about the coming of the just one, who is Jesus, whom you've also betrayed and murdered. You, you who have received the law from God, you who have been given the word by God through angels, you who have been told the truth, yet you did not obey it. What a scathing indictment of these people as well as all of those who reject Christ. And what a scathing indictment of people who, who will not be faithful to God and only come to Him when they need something for from God. Amen. God, I come not just to get something from you. I just come to bless you. Amen. Amen. Let that be us. Let that be our everyday walk with God. 
God, I don't need something from you every time I come to you. I just want to praise you and tell you how much I love you. It's not about me getting something all the time. It's about me glorifying Him. It's about me worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. I know if I do that, God's going to take care of everything anyway. But what, a, what an indictment of these people as well as all who reject Jesus. Stephen told them that they were just as rebellious and disobedient as their forefathers were. And just as they persecuted and killed God's prophets who proclaimed about the coming of Jesus back then, these people have done the same the very same thing presently by rejecting, by betraying, and murdering Jesus themselves. And they have no excuse because the law was given to them through angels. And on that note, neither do we have any excuse not to obey God because God has given His Word which removes all excuses not to do what's right. After hearing what Stephen just said, these people had a choice to make. They could either reject what he said and continue to reject Jesus or they could repent and get saved and get right with God. They could lay down all of their sins and all of their religiosity at the foot of the cross and accept Christ. Or they could continue to hold their religion and their traditions and their man-made rules and regulations and their old way of thinking, which to them was the old law above God Himself. They chose, these particular people chose to hang on to their religiosity because that was what was most important to them. They didn't want to hear anything else other than what they wanted to believe. And many self-professing Christians do that today. Well, brother, that's what our church teaches. That's what our denomination believes. So that's what we believe. Many people are just like these people are, are whom pre, uh, Stephen is preaching to here, who would rather hang on to what a man has taught them above what God's own word has to say. Many people react in anger just like these men did when the truth tears their religion down, which is what the truth, according to the Bible, will always do. God's truth is, is designed to tear anything down that opposes His Word in any way. So when they heard this, when they heard what Stephen just preached, they were offended. They were cut to the heart. They became convicted. And instead of repenting, they got mad at the messenger. They began to grind their teeth at Stephen in their rage. And this was their answer to Stephen, but more importantly, this was their answer to Jesus Christ Himself. A rejection of the truth. A rejection of what the Word of God has to say. A rejection of a message that God would speak through His chosen vessel is a rejection of Jesus Christ Himself. They gnashed on Stephen with their teeth. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked up into heaven. He knew that his redemption was drawing nigh. Amen. He looked up into heaven. He saw the glory of God. He saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open. And I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Though man had rejected Stephen, though man had rejected the words that he spoke, Jesus was with him because Jesus declares in His Word, I don't care what you're going through. I don't care who's coming against you. I don't care what kind of mess you've got yourself in. If you'll put your faith in Me, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you and I'll always be with you even unto the end of the world. Jesus was with Stephen, though everybody else turned their back on him. And that's all that really matters when it comes down to it. Jesus was bringing uh, Stephen through his way. And the glory and the worship that Stephen was giving God was more than these people could take. They totally lost it. They didn't want anything to do with this Jesus whom Stephen preached. How many knows that the world don't mind Jesus, but they want their own version of Jesus. They want their anything goes Jesus. They'll tell them a lie. And they'll tell them you can do what you want to do. You can sin all you want to. You can ignore my commandments. You can ignore my word. And somehow you're still going to be saved. That's a lie from the pits of hell. That's a religious attitude. And people need to know that's not the truth. There ain't but one way to make it into the portals of glory. And that's to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To live for Him each and every day to the best of your ability. To believe in this Word. Every single, uh, every single line of it. Leaving nothing out. And to be willing to do what God calls you to do. 
You cannot reject this word and claim to be saved. You cannot disagree with any part of this word and claim to be saved. I don't care if your best friend's wrapped up in this or that. You can have compassion. we got to have compassion. But we can't shake hands with the sin because sin is not of God. Sin is the enemy of God. Sin put God on the cross and He went to it so we could be free from it. Not so we could shake hands with it. They yelled out at Stephen. They stopped their ears because they didn't want to hear the truth. They reacted in a rage. They rushed him. They rushed Stephen all together. They drug him out of the city. And they stoned him in an effort to stamp out the truth. They took some of their clothes off. And they laid him down at the feet of Saul, who would later become Paul the Apostle, but who now at this time was a great and a mighty persecutor of Christians. They took some of their clothes off so they could be more free to throw these stones at Stephen. They took their clothes off so they could throw them a little harder at Stephen. And as they were stoning him, Stephen called upon God. Stephen's last dying words were, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and he cried out with a loud voice and he said, Lord, lay, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. In other words, don't hold this against them. Please forgive them, God. And after Stephen said that, he died. You see, when Stephen delivered the message that God told him to deliver to these people, he didn't backtrack. He didn't do an about face. He didn't reverse anything that he said in order to save his own skin. He did not conform to the world and accept their evil agenda when they came upon him and dragged him out of that city and were getting ready to stone him. I'm sure Stephen knew what was coming as they were dragging him away, but he never backed up and sat down and kept his mouth shut one time. He never said, oh, let me change something so I can save my own skin. He stood by what he said because that's a, what a spiritual warrior does. We don't compromise. We stand on the truth no matter what. It may cost you your family. It may cost you your job. It may cost you every friend that you got. It may cost you your job or your life, whatever the case may be. But this is our life. Jesus Christ, He is not a religion. He's not a hobby. He's not just something we do on Sundays and Wednesdays. He is a way of life and He's who we live for. He's got to be the air that we breathe. He's got to be all that we do in this life. I work for a living, but I live for Jesus. When it comes down to it, you can have the job, but i got to have Jesus. Amen? And if He's first, He'll take care of everything else. He didn't back down when they dragged Him out of the city and were getting ready to stone Him. Because as the warrior that God called him to be, he stood on the truth. He stood for Jesus. He stood on what God's Word said. He refused to compromise, even though it was going to cost him his life. Because you see, what's more, most important in life is not us, but it is the furtherance of this gospel. Stephen made a stand for Jesus. He had a great testimony of faith in God. He didn't sit down and cry, why me? But he glorified God in his situation. And then he did something else that only a spiritual warrior for Jesus would ever do. He didn't try to call fire down on these people. He didn't want revenge on, on, on these people that were stoning him. What did he do? He prayed for the very people who were stoning him. Stephen asked God to forgive these people who were murdering him, which tells us that Stephen forgave them as they were committing this horrendous act against him. The kind of love that God has was the kind of love that Stephen had. That's exactly the kind of love that all of God's people must have. We can never ever be justified in refusing to forgive people. We can never ever be justified with God in harboring anger, resentment, and bitterness towards anybody. We can never be justified in holding something that somebody has done against us over their head. Because all we got to do is read about Stephen and about how He forgave His murders. And through His testimony, we learn that as God loves and forgives us every single time for all of our sins, we must be the same way to all people. And if we're not, then we're not of God. God, please help us to be spiritual warriors on this earth 
that You've called each and every one of us to be. Help us never to compromise our walk with You in any way. You see, God delivered Stephen. Somebody might say, no, he didn't get delivered. Look what happened to him. He got stoned to death. God delivered Stephen because of his obedience. God didn't do it like we want him to do it when we pray. But God delivered Stephen by taking him to eternity, which is the best kind of deliverance that there is. And you can be assured that Stephen had a crown of righteousness waiting for him because of his great faith and obedience to God. You want that crown of righteousness that God has waiting for you in eternity? Then strive to be the spiritual warrior that God has called each and every one of us to be. As we play something, if you need prayer, you come up here and let's pray for you.